This is a Tibet House member video and is a part of the Force for Good class series, now available at tibethouse.us. Do you, 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 you don't find it confusing, right? Okay. But that quality, that young, soft, open, and uncertain about everything I know, that's it. Like when you practice mindfulness, that's the quality to remember. You know, that's the, there's like a um, the posture of mindfulness when you're placing it before you. You know, like the yoga posture when you're, when you're doing, when you're doing uh, physical yoga. That's, the, that's where you want to be coming from as much as possible. Like that place of uncertainty and vulnerability and openness and really not knowing. Because the, the ex experience even of just watching your breath moment to moment is literally you don't know what the next moment is going to bring. You know, that's like actually we're sitting when we met, we're sitting at this, you, you know, on this uh, fulcrum of, of the present moment, which doesn't even exist. You know, there's no such thing as a present moment. It's like you can turn around and look behind you and see it, it, things slipping away, or you can look in front of you and see it emerging, you know? But it's like a, a constant stream of, oh, we really don't know what's coming next, but here it is, you know? So that's the, that, it's this kind of opening, 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 expanding of the, this quality that we all share, which is just the simple ability to be aware. So a couple more things along the same lines. Um, so my, the two people who taught me mindfulness most directly, uh, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Kornfield, they, uh, uh, they, along with Sharon Salzberg, who I guess was here last week, you know, um, started the meditation center in Massachusetts that I've always gone to called the Insight Meditation Society. So they, they studied in Asia uh, in monastic or semi-monastic circumstances and then tried to recreate here in the West for us a place where these practices could be done. And, you know, the, and they did it. So you can just go there and, and um, practice mindfulness for as long as you want. Uh, Jack uh, left after seven or eight years and moved to California, got married, moved to California and set up in Northern California a kind of similar place called Spirit Rock. Uh, so the, the first seven or eight years that I knew them, they taught together. Uh, and then they, then they uh, divorced and went their separate ways. But they're, they're uh, still linked in their teachings. Um, and I, always, I found them, you know, they were each about 10 years older than I was, so I really looked up to them. They were, they were much more experienced in life already. They had already done this. I, I was lucky enough to become friends with both of them and kind of, you know, got to know them personally as well as, as teachers. And I, that was very useful for me to get to know these people personally because I um, stopped idealizing them. And in not idealizing them, I think I made more room for myself just to be, you, you, you know, a person um, struggling in my own way with my own issues, because I could see them struggling in their ways with their issues. Um, and I was always interested in their books and in their teachings when, when they would let themselves speak more personally. Um, uh, about their own struggles, which they hardly ever did. Uh, so, but a couple of times, like they they let personal stuff leak out uh, in their uh, in their talks or in their books or in their teachings. So these are two of my favorite things, which I think give you a little um, window into them, but also into how the again how the practice of mindfulness can be deployed, not just in a a retreat uh, a meditation context, but also in life. Because that's sort of what I, as a therapist most of the time, that's what I'm interested in. So this first thing is from Joseph Goldstein, um, and it's pretty self-explanatory. I'll just read it to you. One of the most powerful experiences in my meditation practice 
occurred quite a few years ago. I was doing a Zen session with Sasaki Roshi, a very fierce old Zen master. He expressed himself in a classic Zen mode, belligerent and demanding, and this was the first time I had done any Zen practice. One of the nice things about Joseph is that he did, he did not restrict himself just to one Buddhist tradition or another. He would go around Zen teachers, Tibetan teachers, you know, trying to take, trying to learn from the most accomplished people he could find. So, the whole situation of the, um, of the session was geared to making you uptight. Roshi worked with the koan method. The koan is a problem the master gives you that does not have a rational answer. One of the most famous koans is, what, of, what is the sound of one hand clapping? There are many other such questions. In this session, I saw Roshi four times a day to give him the answer to my koan. Everything in the session is very structured, very tight, building the tension and the charge. I went in with my answers, but each time Roshi just rang his bell to dismiss me and said, oh, very stupid. <laughs> this went on and on. Each time I would come in with my answer, he would say, well, it's OK, but it's not Zen. It was totally demeaning, and I was getting more and more uptight. Finally, I think he had a little compassion for me, and he gave me an easier koan. He moved me back, I guess. He asked, how do you manifest the Buddha while chanting a sutra? How do you manifest the Buddha while chanting a sutra? I understood that the principle was to go in and chant a little of a sutra or a discourse. We had been doing some sutra chanting every day. I do not think Sasaki Roshi knew, although he might have known, that this koan plugged in exactly to some very deep conditioning in me going back to the third grade. Our singing teacher back then had said, Goldstein, just mouth the words. <laughs> From then on, I've had a tremendous inhibition about singing. And now here I was, having to perform in a very charged situation. I was a total wreck. In the, pres in the pressure cooker of the session, which is held in silence except for the interviews, everything becomes magnified so much. I rehearsed and rehearsed two lines of chant, all the while getting more and more tight, more and more tense. The bell rang for the interview. I went in, I started chanting, and I messed up the entire thing. I got all the words wrong. I felt completely exposed and vulnerable and raw. And Roshi just looked at me and with great feeling said, very good. <laughs> it was a moment of heart touching heart and it was powerful because I saw that to receive compassion, to receive love, and to connect with both takes a willingness to be open to one's vulnerability, a willingness to be exposed. That is when we can connect heart to heart. So the, the other good story that Joseph tells is when he was doing a self-retreat. He was doing a retreat with a, a visiting Burmese teacher who he respected a great deal, Upandita, I think his name was, and, um, at the meditation center in Massachusetts. And Joseph was doing walking meditation out on the driveway in front of the building. And uh, the room where the uh, teacher was staying was uh, up above the driveway looking out. And, and Joseph was doing his walking meditation, and he looked up, and he saw the, um, the teacher looking out at him. And, uh, and he really, it, it's sort of like when he said in here, he rehearsed and rehearsed the two lines of chant. You know, like that's Joseph, like wanting to be a good boy, you know, and uh, practicing really hard. So he saw the teacher looking out at him from above, and he got his walking really together, and he walked really mindfully, and just like totally got his effort, you know, but but uh, a little uptight, like, like he's saying here. And uh, he kept looking up, and, the, and the, um, the Burmese teacher was kept looking at him until finally he realized that what he was seeing was a lampshade and, <laughs> and wasn't the teacher. So. <clears throat> you sort of have to find it within yourself. I think that's the moral.
Thanks for watching, and please be sure to like and subscribe to support the ongoing work of Tibet House US. Tashi Delek.